This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 180. And did you know, Ben, that we don't record another podcast for four more weeks? Four weeks? What am I going to do? Four week break we have now. Um, which, as much as we love recording these, having a bit of a break is kind of nice because it is always on our mind. At least it's always on my mind through the year. What is it going to be off your mind for the four I weeks don't that know, we're not recording? Maybe. We'll see. We're trying for the first time ever to take a real Christmas break here at the company, so we'll see how able we are to check out. Also got my booster vaccine booked. Very excited about that. Nice. Uh, to kick it off, this is not a very important topic, but for once, you and I were actually on the same page from a viewing standpoint, but for different reasons. So I had texted Ben this morning to see if he was about to or planned on watching Sex in the City. And if you are, and if you've not seen it yet, you might want to skip ahead a couple of minutes to avoid a, a spoiler that's going to be coming up here. Although I'm guessing most people have probably heard the news. I hadn't when I watched it, but... Uh, you would say, yeah, you did want to mention this show, but for a completely different reason. You weren't about to watch Sex in the City, were you? Well, I, I didn't. I didn't watch it either. I just read about. I read about what happened. Yeah, so this is the show that I'd watched back in the '90s. Lisa had watched it as well, and as soon as it came out, she wanted to watch it. So we watched it on the weekend. And first of all, it, it took a couple of jabs at kind of the quintessential 55-year-old made fun of podcasting. They actually use the exact same mic as we do. Carrie's a host of a podcast. Wait, wait. How- how did they make fun of podcasts? Well, they just kind of made fun of, of course, you got a podcast. Basically, was the message, right? So it was kind of <laughs> kind of funny. And then uh, Carrie's still married to Mr. Big. So again, hit fast forward if you don't want a spoiler. But still married to Mr. Big. So it's kind of cool to see the characters like 20 plus years later. And, and of course, Mr. Big's got a Peloton in his beautiful, you know, workout area linked to his bathroom. And anyways, Mr. Big starts working on the Peloton and carries out at an event and doesn't he get off his 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 workout and he has a heart attack carrie comes home and he dies in carrie's arms Ooh, that took a turn so they're kind of making fun of the peloton but then kind of this 55 year old passes away after getting off the peloton um and the reason why you wanted to bring it up is because this came out on thursday and the share price of peloton dropped 11 percent after the episode aired. Yeah, I read I read an article that just talked about this, talked about how Peloton took this, or uh, the, the show took this jab at Peloton and then the share price tanked. And I just thought to myself, geez, what a, what a great example of idiosyncratic <laughs> risk. And that it was. And, and they didn't, the, the show did not disclose that this was coming up to Pelotons. They had no idea that storyline was coming up. But they came back with a pretty good uh, rebuttal. So I saw a statement that was, released to the publication Insider where a cardiologist and member of Peloton's Health and Wellness Advisory Council did a pretty good job of distancing itself from what happened to Mr. Big, saying that I'm sure Sex and the City fans like me are saddened by the news that Mr. Big dies of a heart attack, Dr. Suzanne Steinbaum told Insider. Mr. Big lived what many would call an extravagant lifestyle, including cocktails, cigars, and big steaks, and was at serious risk as he had a cardiac, had he as he had a previous cardiac event in season six. These lifestyle choices and perhaps even his family history, which often is a significant factor, were likely the cause of his death. Shares will continue to go down on Friday. I'd see they're up a little bit today on, on Monday the 13th for what it's worth. <laughs> I, I had no idea that you were a Sex in the City fan. I watched it. It's entertaining. It's fun to see the characters. I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan. Um, Anyways, I was the butt of a few jokes on the weekend. Anyway, some very kind recent reviews. Ali.2e said our, our podcast was approachable yet very thorough. And they say that you and I strike a perfect balance of bringing rigor into every topic and thoroughly exploring it as we did with Sex in the City. Uh. At the same time, keeping the podcast approachable to lay people willing to put in the time to learn about the history, theories, and nuances of investing. Do you want to do the Vinny Bun Bun review? <laughs> uh, sure. Maybe one of the best investing podcasts out there for Canadians. That's the subject or whatever of the, of the review. 
I've been listening to this podcast around, well, typo there, since, since around when it first started after the Canadian Couch Potato podcast ended. It's amazing to see how far these two guys have come. Uh, I hope so. I don't. <laughs> I've never gone back and listened to the old episodes, but I don't. I don't think they're very it's good. Still, fifteen people uh, a day listen to the first episode. Yeah, it's just that's just embarrassing. Uh, b- by far one of the best, if not the best, podcast on investing. Appreciate that very much. Uh, ben and Cameron are so articulate and informative on their discussions, as well as backing everything up with data uh, from academic literature. Yeah, REI expert one hundred one said, "Amazing podcast. Blown away by." buy it and pack with incredible content a phenomenal guest i'll second that the guests we've had have been pretty incredible yep oh that the previous comment that i, I didn't finish reading the end there they they mentioned the, oh, yeah. I, the, the the physician financial conference that i that i spoke at it was kind of cool it was like a conference for physicians on financial wellness and they had uh i don't know four or five speakers and i was i was one it was all online but it was i don't know a few hundred few hundred doctors that attended it was a pretty pretty neat experience to be a part of it's like a i think they're running it as a sort of not-for-profit conference that a, a physician has started that's very cool yeah and then money smart mom said deep dives into personal finances investing and much more a great weekly listen for those looking to learn more about personal finance with episodes on renting versus buying which have been extremely popular and investing with episodes on index investing and inflation they like the two host format, so it's very kind of them. And they also appreciate the book and TV recommendations. So, Your book and TV recommendations <laughs> are huge, <laughs> huge hits on the podcast. Yeah. Um, next week is the third annual year reviewed up episode. And then the week after that, we are off. And then we kick off the new year with an interview with Mac McQuown. And then two weeks after that, with Trillion's author, Robin Wigglesworth. Also wanted to mention new in the store and it'll be available when this podcast drops on the 16th. Rational Minder Tukes. So those on YouTube can see the Tuke. Hmm. As always, connect with us on LinkedIn, Twitter. I'm on Peloton, all jokes aside, CP313 on Peloton and hashtag Rational Reminder. Rational Reminder on Instagram. I don't know if you saw the Instagram post today with Oscar at my desk at home. I don't have Instagram, so I don't it's see any. Pretty funny pictures. So Sun didn't put it out. And got a lot of got a lot of good comments, <laughs> and uh, I am on Goodreads. Anything to add? Nope. You're you're way bigger on social media than I am. I uh, I don't think I answer my LinkedIn. <laughs> Stay connected on LinkedIn. I'm not. I probably won't answer the the connection request. Yeah. Sorry. Apologies. I will. There's lots of neat people that I connected with. I actually heard from someone today in New Jersey. So shout out to Daniel for reaching out to us. It was great to hear from him. Okay, let's go to the main part. Welcome to episode 180 of the Rational Reminder podcast. Let's kick it off with a book review as always. So a few weeks ago, I mentioned the book by Michael Dell that I heard him on a podcast and he wrote the book called Play Nice But Win. So this is his version of Dell Computers about it being founded, going public, taking it private, then going public again. Unbelievable story. And so many things Mm. could have gone so bad all the way along the way. Anyway, so it starts out, he had an incredible observation about computers and obsession with computers early on. So he is one year older than I am. So I remember back in the mid to late 70s in high school being told, eh, don't worry about computers. Everything that needs to be programmed has been done. There's no point to be coding. It's just going to be a fad. There'll be one computer, it'll be all done. Okay, he took a different path. He's worth $57 billion or something today. Anyways, he was obsessed with computers, but also the personal computer and how it could change how people's uh, productivity levels uh, could explode with what he saw coming, which is so cool. Anyway, so he started college in the early 80s and started building custom computers early on. And he actually would take apart IBM computers and realize that they were full of components that he could buy off Mm. the shelf. They weren't IBM components, right? IBM saw PCs as simply a way for their customers to to connect to the mainframes, which was their real business. It wasn't really too fussed about someone else kind of ripping off or improving computers. 
mm-hmm. at the same time, this is the 80s, this is before the tech boom, he also figured out that a better business model was one where you could build computers on demand, therefore the technology is fresher, computers are faster, they can make it cheaper and have less inventory cost, which obviously is the Dell model. Get this, at 22 years old, which is in the mid 80s, he had $60 million in annual sales. Wow. By the year 2000, they were up to $25 billion in sales. And he, he actually comments in the book about the whole tech bubble and how he felt the price was so inflated, he felt that they were getting credit for things they hadn't done yet, which in hindsight, I, I guess is true. But I can tell you, I remember the year 2000 in the tech bubble here in Ottawa, where you know big companies like Nortel were buying all of their gear from, from Dell, and you would place an order for Dell, and you would just wait so long to get delivery of it because the demand was just through the roof. Hmm. Anyways, th- he tells a story going through time, you know, um, 2001 after 9-11, how they supplied thousands of computers into New York City and Washington after the destruction of what happened. The best part of the book for me was how he negotiated to take the company private and how he had to deal with you know com- companies like Blackstone as well as Carl Icahn. And he was unbelievably blunt about how awful a person he puts it, Carl Icahn was. Hmm. Anyways, ended up figuring out how to do it. They got financing from a company. So he, they took it private. He ended up with more than 70% ownership after that. Um, so this was in 2013, 2014 timeframe. They went private. He ended up with 75% of the company. And then the years after that, he decided he had to broaden the offering and get into other areas of IT infrastructure. So in 2016, when they're still private, they took over EMC, which I'd forgotten about, which is a cloud computing um, product and services company. And EMC owned VMware, which is a cloud computing software company. So this Mm -hmm. made Dell a leader in infrastructure IT. Get this, sales at this point got up to $70 billion and hit $100 billion a year by 2018. Uh, but because of the share structure at VMware, they decided to bring the company public again in 2018. Hmm. So it's it's just an unbelievable story of, you know, going to the wall on risk and almost completely blowing up dealing with Icon and um, and Blackstone back in 2013. It wasn't obvious that he was going to pull this off, and here he is hmm. today. You know, his net worth is well over 50 billion dollars, and it's just a. a a massive great success story and how IBM had it and they didn't see the value in it at the time. Yeah, unreal. Another story, which I'd asked you this morning, if you had heard about, and I didn't know this story, but he talked about how being he was friends with both Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. And this kind of links back to idiosyncratic risk you talked about earlier. But in 1997, Apple was on its deathbed and Microsoft gave them a $150 million lifeline, if you can believe it. I didn't know that story. No, I didn't either. That's a crazy story. Anyways, it's a it's a it's a really enjoyable book, easy read. Play nice but win. On to the the study that you found? Sure. Fire away. All right. So you, you sent me the study. Uh want to be happy, hire a financial advisor. Now I'm very skeptical. Well, I knew you would when I shared it to you. I thought you were gonna shoot it down pretty good. Especially when just something, the title I was, and you know the industry would be all over this just by the title, right? You know they would be, um, but hey, we're we're talking about it, so I guess they did they did something a little bit right, maybe. Uh, but the other big reason for skepticism is that it's from yeah a company that consults for and trains financial advisors. Uh, it's not a peer reviewed paper, um, so yeah, I, I went into it very skeptical, but. I read through it and there's okay. There, there were a couple of interesting data points that I thought I thought it was worth at least briefly going over it. Um, so they surveyed a thousand randomly selected com- consumers across the U.S. to be included in the study. They the respondents had to have self-reported uh, household net worth of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or more. Just over half of the respondents were male, uh, and seventy nine percent were either married or living with a significant other. Uh, to gauge happiness, because that's always one of the big questions. How do you measure happiness? Uh, they created a list of 43 statements where respondents were asked to indicate how strongly they agreed or disagreed with a series of, well, with, with the statements, with the 43 statements. And that's what gauged their 
their happiness. And this is all, it was set up by a PhD. Like the person doing this research uh, is a PhD in, in psychology. Uh, so they identified four distinct and highly reliable factors that were significantly predictive of happiness. And those were fulf fulfillment or fulfilled, intentional, impactful, and grateful. Uh, all four factors in their study were heightened among 66% of consumers who work with a financial advisor versus 34% of those who do not when controlling for age, gender, income, and asset levels. So they're basically saying people in their sample who have a financial advisor are happier. And that's like, I mean, yeah, measuring happiness is pretty sketchy regardless. So I'm, I'm still skeptical. But they're not but suggesting causality. The, the, like maybe happier people uh, work with advisors as opposed to advisors make people happier. Well, I think they kind of are suggesting causality, which is one of the many reasons I was a bit skeptical. I mean, they're, they're saying people with financial advisors are happier. Like that's the, what was the title of the article? Wants to be happy, hire a financial advisor. That's, that's suggesting that's causality. causality. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty funny. It might just be that happier people reach out to advisors. Yeah, it that could be. It's like uh, su successful people. Uh, yeah. are happier, but it could just be that happier people okay. are, are successful. Same same idea. So, so far, I'm, I, I read it and I was like, okay, I mean, I mean, that's, this is, you know, not worth talking about. But then there's one one chart uh, in, in the paper that, I mean, I don't know, it just spoke to me because the anecdotal experience for, for us is is somewhat similar, I think. Um, but they found that the differences in happiness for households with assets below $1.2 million dollars are, I mean, they're there, like there is a difference in happiness where the people with financial advisors are happier, but above the 1.2 to $2.6 million asset level, there's this massive divergence where households with a financial advisor are significantly happier and those without are significantly less happy. Um, and I don't know, I, I looked at that and it, it's like, it's a big enough difference that even with a, a, a small sample size, it's like there's there seems to be something there, at least in their sample. Um, but then just thinking about our, our lives and what we do for people, it's not like it's glamorous work. So, and, and there's definitely a correlation between complexity, uh, complexity and, uh, and assets. So it would make sense that households with like 3 million plus, which is kind of what they found of assets. Um, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a lot to, it's complexity, it's but manage. it's also responsibility, right? Like we've met so many people mm. who just can't pull the trigger on large amounts of money. It's yeah. that confidence. And there's just more stuff. Yeah. Like there's there's more tasks to keep track of, more decisions that have to be made. Anyway, so, you know, I, I don't think this study is going to make it into any uh, peer-reviewed journals, but it, it was it was interesting. And I, I just thought that last point about the relationship between assets, asset levels, advice, and happiness was, uh, I don't know, interesting in my probably biased opinion for sure you want to talk about peter lynch yeah i just saw this article with peter lynch um warning passive investors they're losing out and backing the best fund managers uh, to keep beating the market uh yeah i mean it jumped out of me because well i'll talk about it um, so P Peter Lynch is saying that he expects the top active managers to beat the market, whether that's a reasonable expectation or not. Well, well, I don't know. Yeah, probably not. This is a name not statistically I've, anyway. I've heard of this name for so long. It's come up so many times. Peter Lynch. Oh my God. <laughs> uh, so he, he says the move to passive is a mistake and people are missing the boat. He compared the process of selecting a good fund to seeking out an orthopedist or heart surgeon in the top quartile of their profession. Now, we'll talk about quartiles in a second. Uh, but why do we listen to Peter Lynch? And this is the main reason that this article jumped out at me is, is worth talking about on, on the podcast. Lynch ran Fidelity's Magellan Fund from 1977 to 1990. Uh, the fund earned an, an, uh, an average annual return of 26.4% over the period that he managed it. Do it doubled the, the S&P 500. Yep. It was the best performing yep. fund while he managed it. Best performing fund in the U.S. while he managed it. <clears throat> now there's the you know the, the the blemish on that number is that the average investor return in the fund was like I can't remember well below the fund return and I think it might have even been uh, negative for the average investor because they were getting in and out at at inopportune times as as investors tend to do. 
Uh, Lynch grew the fund's assets from 18 million to 14 billion between 1977 and 1990. One of the things that is pretty much always ignored unless you really dig dig for the information is, is that the fund wasn't open to the public until 1981. So that I did not so know. Prior, prior to that, Lynch was managing like private fidelity family, like the Johnson family and, and partners money. Um, and then even before that, so the fund was established in 1963 uh, as an incubator fund. So only insiders could put money into it including for four of the years when uh, Lynch managed it. And the idea, of course, being fund companies do this. They start funds, they, well, throw a bunch of funds at the wall, see what sticks uh, in incubation, and then whatever does well, it's like, hey, look how well this fund did. But the ones that don't do well, you just never, you never hear about. It's one of the, one of the funny things that the uh, active management industry does. Uh, prior to Lynch taking over, the fund had been managed by Edward C. Johnson, the founder of Fidelity, uh, until 1971, and his returns were actually great too. I just thought that was kind of uh, kind of interesting. And then there was one other manager in the interim, and then Lynch Lynch takes over. But Lynch wasn't able uh, to find a successful successor to him. Well, I'm gonna. I, I oh, know. Is that coming That's up? One of the big I'm points. Funny. Well, Lynch is saying, "Hey, you can find the, you can find good active managers." Okay, why didn't you do it after you left right. Magellan? <laughs> Um, so from, from 1977 until 81, the period when you couldn't invest in the fund, uh, he returned an annualized 44%, which is pretty astonishingly great. Um, when it was open to the public for, for those nine years, uh, it returned 22%, which is a, a bit better, uh, 6% better than the S&P 500 over that time period. So it's not doubling the market's return like it looks like it is if you look at the full performance period, including when it was not open to the public. Now, the five-factor alpha was statistically significant over this period, so he was he was doing it. I'm not saying that Lynch didn't do a good job. Uh, there's definitely some credit some credit due there. But then the the, the point that follows is what you said, Cameron. Is you know this is the, the, say he was a skilled manager. Um, he he left on a good note. Good for him. His job on departure is to help find a successor that should be able to continue delivering the same type of performance, especially consider that considering that he's going public saying you can find a good active manager that's going to beat the market. Well, yeah, didn't uh, you had one job? Didn't work out so you well. You had one job. Yeah, <laughs> uh, uh, I looked at the Spiva mid year twenty twenty one report. Uh, over 20-year periods, roughly 90% of active managers trail their index. And between 20%, which is crazy, and 50% of funds survive for 20 years, depending on the fund category. I can't remember which category it was, but in one fund category, the survivorship is 20% for 20 years, which is astonishing. Uh, weighted by assets, the average fund in the all domestic funds category roughly underperforms the S&P 500 by fees, 81 basis points, like a, a bit more, I think, than the average U.S. mutual fund fee, equity fund fee. Uh, but equal weighted, the average fund trails by 127 basis points. And that just demonstrates the skewness in active manager fund returns. Some funds do really well. But those funds that do well, do they continue to do well, as Lynch says? Do we, do we find that top quartile manager? Well, let's see. So there were 549 top quartile fund managers in domestic U.S. equity funds in June 2017. By June 2021, only 13 of those, of the 549, that's 2.37%, had managed to remain Incredible. top quartile. Incredible. So uh, Peter Lynch had impressive performance, um, particularly when the fund that he managed was not available to the public, but also when it was but he wasn't able to successfully pick a successor manager. And uh, the broader data show that uh, what Lynch is telling people to do is just not, uh, not, not likely, I guess. Unreal story. I think so. Uh, the other one I want to talk about is uh, a li listener question. It came up a little bit in the Rational Minder community and it came up twice in in two days on on YouTube. I don't know. I don't know why, but I got. I don't always kind of look through all the comments that I get on YouTube, but I'll kind of flip through them 
I don't know, once every couple of days and sometimes they catch my eye and, and these ones did, especially because there were two of them from different, uh, from different people. Um, so we, we, we don't make predictions as, as people know, but uh, we, we, we do talk about expected returns and a couple times in the last couple of years, we've made some, some pretty strong statements about expected returns related to FANG stocks when they were just returning huge amounts uh, for a period of time there. And likewise with ARC funds, with Kathy Woods funds, when again, just they, they had huge returns and whenever stuff has huge returns, people talk about it. So we, we did too. <laughs> in, uh, in September, 2020, we released a video on large cap growth stocks. That was on Common Sense Investing. We also talked about it on the podcast. And we basically said, yeah, these things have had really good performance in recent history. Uh, but now that they are these massive, high-priced companies, they have low expected returns, which is true. It has to be. It's it's not a law of physics, but it's kind of close. <laughs> uh, so someone commented on that video saying that, that it, in, interesting theory, but this video didn't age well based on the performance of large cap growth since it was published. I, I read that comment. I hadn't, I didn't have in my head, like what, what was the performance of large growth versus the market or large growth versus small value or anything like that. Cause I said in the video, these things have low expected returns, large cap growth. If you want higher expected returns, you should look at small cap value stocks. So I went and ran the numbers because I was curious. <laughs> and we know how this goes. Um, so from September 2020 until the end of November 2021, the equal weighted portfolio of Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Tesla, which is what I, I talked about in the beginning of that, of that video, had underperformed AVUV, which as many listeners know is a small cap value uh, fund. So the, the, those big stocks had underperformed the small cap value fund by an annualized 19% from September 2020 until the end of November 2021. They, they didn't outperform. The, the big stocks didn't outperform. So I, I don't know about the video not aging well. Um, and then the NASDAQ 100 index, so a broader index of those high-priced large tech companies. Uh, and I use QQQ, so this is after fees, an actual index fund. It, it trailed AVUV over the same period by an annualized 29%. Incredible. It's a big number. Ouch. That's a big number. Uh, no, it's AVUV. That's extreme. It's a, it's a small cap value fund. It's not the market. Um, <clears throat> year to date 2021, uh, and this is as of December 9th, so Friday of the week previous to recording this, uh, the equal weighted portfolio of those same big stocks, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Google, Microsoft, and Tesla had underperformed AVUV, AVUV by 2.5%. And the QQQ NASDAQ 100 index fund had trailed AVUV by 11.2% year to date so far. Now, of course, this is just short-term noise. Just like those stocks outperforming prior to that video being released was, was also short-term noise. Um, but I don't know. It's just inter interesting to see that uh, a couple people out there were saying large cap growth has continued to do well when it actually hadn't, at least not relative to uh, to small value. And then an another commenter <clears throat> in one of these threads said that they feel better about QQQ than AVUV long term. I kind of said, okay, fine, Ben, you got me there, but I feel better about QQQ long term. I, again, I just thought, I wonder how how QQQs, because it's been around for a long time, um, since 1999. Um, so I kind of wondered, how has it done relative to small value since then? Because we know it's been a rough go for small value recently, right? Um, so QQQs returned 10% annualized since inception in March 1999. Pretty good. Indeed. DFA US small value, which is kind of like AVUV, but <clears throat> the Dimensional Fund has the benefit of going back to 1993 instead of 2019 for AVUV, uh, that dimensional U.S. small cap value fund has returned 11.01% annualized. And that's after fees in both cases, but keeping in mind that dimensional's fees on that small cap value fund, uh, they've come down significantly since the fund was launched right. in 1993. Isn't that interesting? I don't know exactly what the fees, yeah, yeah, yeah. So if we kind of went back and looked at the performance net of current fees in both cases, that spread would be even more significant. 
Uh, the, the other interesting point on this is, you know, for someone to say, I feel better about QQQ than AVUV, like today. I'm sitting here looking at the market yeah. today. I feel better about QQQ. The last time valuations on the large cap growth stocks looked like they do today or higher, that they're higher today. If you use book to market, and I know some people don't like using that metric, but if you, if you do use that one, uh, valuations are currently a lot higher than they were in 1999. If you use like price to cash flow, uh, they're roughly the same as they were back then. So the last time valuations were around here, QQQ had a decade of meaningfully negative performance. You lost 8% per year on average for the decade ending February 2010 in QQQ. And over the same period, small value, U.S. small value returned 8.54%. And even the S&P 500 was negative a little bit, like negative 0.3 for that <clears throat> decade, I think, something yeah. like that. Yeah, a little bit negative. I think the U.S. total market was, was flat. Yeah. That's the U.S. lost decade. But yeah, if you were in large growth for the last decade, oof, ouch. But it wasn't the lost yeah. decade. Your point is it wasn't the lost decade for small value. Yeah, it wasn't. Well, it wasn't the last decade for small value, for value, for international stocks, for, for Canadian stocks. Market, just, in, yep. just in U.S. market. That was not, not the best time to, uh, to be a U.S. cap-weighted investor. Uh, okay, so that was small value, large growth. And then, uh, then I just started thinking, like, what, what other predictions have we made? Or not predictions. What other statements have we made about expected returns that, that could be viewed as a prediction? <laughs> Uh, so in December 2020, we made the video on technological revolutions. We did two two Rational Minder episodes on that. Uh, and I was kind of motivated by Kathy Wood. Like what really got me thinking about innovation is that we had several clients reach out saying, you know, wh why are we investing in this value stuff when innovation is the key? We've got to invest in this technological revolution that we're living through. And it's I, you know, I saw that and was like, geez, what what is the response? I didn't really know. So we went and figured it out came back and then everyone kind of knows the rest because they heard the, heard those episodes or some people did at least. Um, so from when that video came out in December 2020, and this is the Common Sense Investing version of it, release date, uh, until November 2021, the flagship ARK Innovation ETF returned an annualized four, negative 4.27%, while AVUV has returned an annualized 47% over the same period. And again, in that video, I'm kind of saying, listen, if you want excitement, if you want high expected returns, large growth is not the way to go. You should look at small value. And there we go. Um, and then we released another one. And this one was even more directly related to Kathy Wood because ARC returns were just insane and we're, we're getting questions about it. Uh, so that was the one on chasing top fund managers. Um, and at the time, when that video came out in February 2021, ARC was still killing it. And I got comments when the video came out, like, Ben, you're crazy. Like, you know, Kathy's taking us to the moon. <laughs> and she was at that sure time. Sure was. The money was pouring in. And, oh, yeah. I've got some notes on that. Um, now, in hindsight, and a lot of people said this in, uh, in comments and in the Rational Minder community, that that video came out basically at the peak for ARC, which is kind of funny. I didn't time that. <laughs> it wasn't on purpose. Um, the expected returns were just so low. It was... It was kind of obvious. Uh, so from March to November 2021, ARC delivered a negative 18.87% return, while AVUV had delivered 14.84%. Pretty That's rough positive there. 14.84%. Yeah, yeah, negative 18.87 18. for ARC and 14.84 positive so for AVUV. 32, 33% delta. Ouch. I'm not saying I predicted it. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not the hedge fund manager here, but uh, it's just kind of kind of fun to look back. Um, now on Arc, so you mentioned when the money came in, Cameron. Uh, Three point two billion dollars were in the fund at the start of 2020, and then the returns are just screaming. It's crazy. By the end of 2020, Arc had 34.4 billion dollars in it. So calendar year 20. Uh, 2020, massive inflows. And most of those inflows came in late in 2020. Uh, and early 2021 continued to have big inflows. Uh, they were adding, investors were adding more than $2 billion per month during December, January, and February. Uh, 
the December 2020, January, February of 2021 this year. The assets hit a high of 51.3 billion at the end of February of 2021. And then as we just said, it's been negative performance since then. So most of the dollars in the fund got in as tends to happen. I mean, there's there's data on this. It's not just this one instance. This is what tends to happen with crazy uh, successful fund managers. Most investors get in at the worst possible time. So I don't have the data on the average dollar performance. I know there was some analysis that was posted in the community probably six months ago. So I didn't put it in the notes just because it's a bit stale at this point, but they were showing really bad um, uh, returns for the average investor in the fund based on the timing of the- The, the money weighted returns. The cash flows. Yeah. Right. Um, so a, a, AVUV, like we're talking about a small cap value uh, ETF, it's not a good benchmark for large growth or for no. Kathy Wood's funds. But I just thought it was interesting because in all those videos where we're talking about like, listen, lo- expected returns are low on these assets that everybody's excited about. If you want excitement and high expected returns, you should look at this small cap value stuff. And, you know, there we go. It uh, it happened, at least over this time period. By next month, maybe we'll be wrong again. Yeah, you're not doing a victory lap here. You're just pointing out where higher expected returns are. It's not it's not a victory lap, but a, a little bit it is. A little bit, but not really. Okay, you wanted to talk about housing. Yeah. And the B word. Housing, again. The what? And the B word. Yeah, is there a bub- uh, housing bubble in Canada? I think it's a pretty interesting question. And I'll, uh, I'll give away the answer. I don't think that there is which might surprise a lot of people. So where did the inspiration for this come from? Uh, you always ask me that question. I never have a good answer. I don't know. Um, I don't know. I was thinking about it and then I started modeling it and then the model was pretty interesting. So I started writing about it. <laughs> I don't know what the seed That's was. I don't answer. know what the genesis was. Uh, so Canadian home prices as people in Canada and maybe even other people outside of Canada know are very high. But this is the key, like the key to this whole thing. Are, are we in a housing bubble? The key is that the cost of living in a house is not the price of the house. And so we have to understand this concept called user cost, the user cost of housing. And this, I, I got this from a paper by Himmelberg, Mayer, and Sinai. It's a 2005 paper assessing high house prices, bubbles, fundamentals, and misperceptions. And it's kind of like the the unrecoverable costs. The user cost is kind of like the total unrecoverable cost of living in a home, uh, which is different from the price, and and much more relevant for assessing how expensive is housing in a in a region. So people need a place to live, of course, and in in economic speak, people consume housing services. So theoretically, it shouldn't make much of a difference whether people choose to own, uh, which provides both housing services and a a real estate asset, uh, or by renting, which kind of disentangles the housing services flow from asset allocation. In in equilibrium, you'd expect the costs, the user cost of owning to be very similar to the market price of rent. In equilibrium. Doesn't mean it's always going to be true, obviously, but in, in equilibrium, that's what you would expect. Um, what can happen though, and what people I think are saying when they say that we're in a housing bubble is that the cost of owning can be subsidized by high price returns on real estate. If you buy a house, you buy a house and you start living in it and it returns 20% a year on the asset, your cost of living in it is negative, right? right? You've ma- You've made money by owning a home instead of investing in some other some other asset, unless that other asset was AVUV, I guess, because it had, had like 40% returns, <laughs> at least recently. Uh, adjusted for inflation, home prices in Canada tripled from 1990 to 2021, and incomes over that period only rose by 20% total. So you can see house prices outpaced incomes in real terms pretty significantly over that over that time period. If we compare prices to incomes, I mean, it it looks like a bubble. We'll put a chart on the YouTube video. It's just this hockey stick line of 
prices increasing while incomes increase pretty modestly over the over the same period. Um, and it's the same kind of story if you compare prices to rents. It's the same kind of hockey stick. Like, geez, we must be in a housing bubble for prices to be that high relative to rents. But that comparison is irrelevant. It doesn't make sense to compare prices to to rents. Um, to, to understand the relationship between prices and housing costs, that's where the, the user cost concept uh, comes into play and becomes really, really important. Uh, and once we have a user cost figure, like what is the actual cost of living in a home? It's not its price. What is the actual cost? Once we have that, we can compare that to incomes historically, and we can compare that to rents historically. And then we can see, okay, our user costs higher or, or, or ridiculously higher relative to history. Um, and th- th- this is pretty similar to the 5% rule stuff that we've done in the past. The, the big difference is I've used, and I actually, I, th- I might like what they do better, although they have different, different purposes, I think. Um, but they've used the 10% real uh, interest rate on government bonds, real yield on government bonds. Uh, as the opportunity cost. And then they've separately assigned a risk premium for owners over renters because owning a home is risky. And we'll talk more about that in a second. People might be raising an eyebrow at owning a home being risky. Uh, I used no risk premium for the owner and used stocks as the opportunity cost. So it's a slightly right. different model. I think they have they have different applications. Um, for someone actually making the decision to rent versus buy, I, I like my five percent rule. But for assessing housing yeah. costs, I think I think th- this model makes a lot more sense. Um, okay, so the the user cost it breaks down as the the opportunity cost, the foregone investment return that the owner could have received investing in something other than a house. And like I mentioned, Himmelberg, Mayer, and Sinai use the real yield on ten year government bonds. So that's the first term uh, plus property taxes minus the tax deductibility of mortgage interest. I'm not going to mention that one again just because it's not relevant in Canada. In the States, there is a a deduction for mortgage interest. In Canada, there is not. Uh, Plus maintenance costs is a fraction of the home value, minus the expected capital gain on the real estate asset, plus a risk premium to compensate the owner for the higher risk of owning versus renting. So we'll talk through each of those terms. Uh, the, The expected capital gain on the real estate asset is really important because like I mentioned earlier, if you expect huge capital gains, you'd be willing to pay a lot for a house. Your cost of living there could be negative and you could be speculating on the future appreciation of the asset. And that actually ties into the definition of a bubble that Himmelberg, Mayer, and Sinai use. Uh, They say, they describe a bubble, a housing bubble, as being driven by home buyers who are willing to pay inflated prices for houses today because they expect unrealistically high, uh, high housing appreciation in the future. So that's a key definition there, and it's it's what we're going to try and answer. Based on where prices are now, is Canada in a housing bubble, bubble based on that definition? Are people expecting, or do people have to be expecting unrealistically high housing appreciation to justify current prices? And I think a lot of people would think, yes, that is the case, but I don't, I don't actually think it is. Um, so what is reasonable to expect? What is the, the housing expectation? Uh, globally, it's been price return about 1% above inflation historically. Uh, in Canada, from 2002 until now, prices have increased by 5.5% per year after inflation, which is pretty significant. Um, prior to that, though, from 19, and that's Canada wide, some cities and provinces would be a lot higher. Um, prior to that, from 1980 to 2001, Canadian average home prices appreciated about 1% above Canadian inflation. So in line with the historical average. So it's this more recent history, which interestingly lines up with with interest rates falling. And and we'll talk about why that's important and interesting in in a bit. Uh, But there there is some coincidence there. Uh, In a 2004 paper, uh, Robert Schiller and Carl Case, they documented survey data in U.S. real estate markets in 1988, which ended up being followed by pretty significant price declines in the U.S. And in 2003, which was early on in the U.S. real estate bubble that culminated in the great financial crisis. Um, 
and that this is a it's a fascinating paper that they did on this on this topic. And there there are a lot of papers in the U.S. from economists because they obviously had this big incident, so lots of people wrote about it. Uh, they they show that most respondents to the survey view their home primarily. Most respondents view their home primarily as an investment, with the remainder viewing it at least in part as an investment. Uh, a minority of, resp- of respondents to their survey viewed real estate as involving a great deal of risk. So most people view it as an investment. Few people view it as having risk. And a vast majority of respondents expected positive price returns for the next several years with estimates for the 10-year price return ranging from 7.3% to 15.7%, depending on the city and time period wow. in the survey. Yeah. So big, big price expectations in 2003 and 1988 in the U.S. Now, of course, we know now, looking back, that those expectations were not realistic. And even though they seemed to come true for a bit uh, following 2003, as we all know, U.S. real estate prices did fall dramatically not long after. And Case and Schiller find in their survey that most respondents, keeping in mind their unrealistic price appreciation estimates, believe that desirable real estate just naturally appreciates rapidly. So if you're in, you know, uh, Vancouver, um, Toronto, places like Ottawa right now, uh, places where it's desirable to live, Vancouver Island, where I grew up, uh, places where it's desirable to live, there's there's finite land. Um, people in, in their, in Case and Schiller survey, people believe that places like that just they just have high price returns. They just do. But that doesn't make any sense. And Case and Schiller clear this up in their paper. They say that this is economically flawed thinking. Uh, properties that people find most attractive will be highly priced, but they're not necessarily going to be increasing more rapidly in price than other properties. Which, I mean, that of course that makes sense. But people have the idea that, well, if you buy in Toronto, returns are going to be 6% a year forever because it's Toronto. No, prices are going to be high today. Which Otherwise, that person would not have sold it to you. Yeah. If they were expecting the same return that you were, they never would have sold it. Right. Uh, okay, so one of the other big inputs for the user cost is the risk premium for owning instead of renting. Uh, I think the common perception is that home ownership is the safer option. So why would there be a risk premium for owning? Uh, owners have to deal with real estate price risk on a single real estate asset. And we'll talk about why that's important in a second. They also have large lumpy maintenance expenses, uh, potential changes and, and potential changes in debt service and costs if, if they have a, a mortgage. Uh, so I, on the individual real estate asset, if you look at aggregate real estate indexes, they're less volatile than stocks. So people say, well, okay, real estate's a safe asset class to own. But the price, rif- price risk of an individual home is substantially greater than an index. And there's a paper from Case and Schiller on this topic, a 1989 paper, uh, and they looked at the standard deviation of real estate indexes and they say, yeah, it's, it's pretty low, but uh, real estate's heterogeneous. It's not like stocks where they're, they're kind of fungible. Every stock is, every stock is the same, uh, but every real estate asset is unique. They're like NFTs, but real. Uh, even if you take an identical home on the same street, uh, there's going to be some differences, like the view or the proximity to the bus stop or the, I don't know what else could be, closest to the school or something. Curb appeal. <laughs> yeah, curb appeal. Uh, in Case and Schiller's sample in this 1989 paper, they find that the standard deviation of individual home prices, so not the real estate index, individual home prices is about 15% wow. per year, which is more volatile than, than stocks. And that's really important because if we look at long-term real estate data, like there's the the rate of return on everything paper that goes back to the 1800s and it shows that, yeah, stock, uh, real estate in aggregate, residential real estate in aggregate has performed roughly the same as stocks-ish, but it's been less volatile. Great. But nobody buys or invests in the real estate index. They buy a single property and Case and Schiller find substantially more volatility if we measure it by individual homes. So that's important. Uh, Himmelberg, Mayer, and Sine in their paper, they use a 2% risk premium, and that came from another paper, a 2002 paper, 
uh, owner-occupied housing and the composition of the household portfolio by Flavin and Yamashita. Uh, but they also note that that 2% risk premium is unlikely to be constant, particularly for markets with high prices relative to fundamentals or so-called glamour cities, where the risk of owning can be much greater measured by the standard deviation of prices. And that difference in volatility for glamour cities versus other cities, that's also documented in Case and Schiller's 2004 paper that I've mentioned uh, a couple of times. Hmm. Uh, so I, I, I think that that uh, price risk of individual homes, I mean, I, I think it often gets ignored, especially in Canada where we're just seeing prices go up and up and and up. But I, I, I think they're, I think it makes sense to model a risk premium for owning instead of instead of renting. I don't think that's an unreasonable assumption, whether it's two percent or not, and that's something that I well, I'll touch on briefly later, but that's a, that's an open question. And I think it's one of the things that we can answer with with the model. So once we have the user cost equation set up, we can see um, holding everything else constant, what risk premium are people using to price homes or what appreciation rate or whatever. It's, it can be some combination of changing those variables to, to observe them based on prices. Uh, now, one of the other things that came up in in doing research for this is high prices could be driven by real estate investors, which is kind of kind of a scary thought. And I think people worry about that a lot, at least in the in the media. Um, there was a talk that the Bank of Canada deputy governor did in, in late November of, of this year, and they showed data that the largest increase in new mortgages during the pandemic housing boom came from real estate investors by by a pretty wide margin. And the Bank of Canada's warning in this talk about extrapolative expectations driving real estate investor behavior. So we're back to that idea of a bubble, of prices being high because people expect them to be high in the future. So these are investors, they're not people living in the homes? That is correct, yeah. Yeah, and I think we can put a chart up on on that. Uh, I think I screen captured something from from that Bank of Canada talk showing it was the, the increase in mortgage origination for, for different categories of buyers, but investors had the largest uh, the largest increase. Now, what is that? What information does that contain? Does it contain any information? Um, if we look at the U.S. experience, it's probably not a good thing. There's a 2011 staff report from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York titled "Real Estate Investors: The Leverage Cycle and the Housing Market Crisis," and in that paper, the authors find that in states that experience the largest housing booms and busts, at the peak of the market, almost half of purchase mortgage originations were associated with investors. So you know. Maybe that is a uh, a red flag, something wow. to be something to be worried about. Yeah, and I, I mentioned earlier, price risk is particularly problematic in high priced cities, and I think that's a lot of places right now. I mean, Ottawa, I think, became a high priced city in the last couple of years, even though it wasn't uh, prior to that. Probably still not as high as some other cities, but in any case, high priced cities um, are are riskier, at least based on Case and Schiller's U.S. data. Uh, you could always argue that it's different in Canada, and uh, and maybe it is. Okay, so risk in the market. Investors may be driving up prices, who knows. Um, I, I think it's important to mention, though, that there is an offsetting effect. So we have that 2% risk premium that, that, that this paper that we're talking about uh, used for, for owners over over renters, I just talked about a bunch of reasons why owning a real estate asset could be risky, but there's an important point on why it's actually not risky, or at least why there's an offsetting effect. Um, price risk only materializes if you need to sell your home and buy in a relatively expensive market. And that's important, because if you sell your home, even if, if Ottawa real estate tanks, and you, Cameron, decide to sell your house, and you decide to move to, I don't know, where would you move? Doesn't matter, somewhere cheaper. I was trying to get some imagery of where you'd be living, but yeah, sure, somewhere cheaper. Then it doesn't matter. If Ottawa drops 20% in price, but you're moving to some other city that's dropped 30%, it's it's not so bad. Um, but if Ottawa goes up 10% and you need to move to Toronto that's up 20%, that's that's price risk. You're you're, yeah. you're taking a loss on, on that asset. Uh, and that can happen for lots of reasons. Like why do people move? Uh, work, family, I don't know, other other reasons. But if you don't need to move, 
or if you're moving to a correlated market, if auto is up 20% and wherever you're going is also up 20%, it doesn't matter. You, you lose on transaction costs, but you're not taking the, the price risk. So I, th I think that speaks to the careful consideration for time horizon when you're buying a house. If you're gonna need to move in three years, as I probably wouldn't buy, if it's gonna be 25 years, well, you're not taking a whole lot of price risk. Um, when you buy a house, you receive a housing services perpetuity. And that's a term I got from uh, one of John Cochran's papers. I think his paper on, I can't remember which one it was, but he, he refers to housing as a housing services perpetuity. I thought that was kind of uh, kind of elegant. It's like uh, like a perpetuity, and John Cochran talked about this when he was a guest on our podcast. Per perpetuities, if you mark them to market, are going to be extremely volatile in price. But if you're a long-term investor, you don't care about that because you're collecting the cash flow stream from the perpetuity, which is why you bought it. Houses are pretty similar, where the price is going to be volatile if you're marking it to market every day. But if you bought a house to live in forever, you're going to receive the housing services perpetuity. Exactly. And it doesn't matter. Interesting. But if you move frequently between transaction costs and price risks, I, I think it's uh, it, th that just deserves careful, careful consideration. Um, the, the hedging property of owned homes is documented in a paper by Senai and Suleles in, in uh, its 2005 paper, Owner Occupied Housing as a Hedge Against Rent Risk. And they find that the insurance demand, they found this in a model, but then they've tested it empirically and, and found it to be true. Um, the, the insurance demand for homeownership will increase with households expected horizon and with the interaction of horizon with rent risk. So house, households in areas with greater rent volatility are going to be willing to pay more to own a home to hedge their housing costs. And this is increasingly true the longer that people plan to live in that area. So households with longer horizons are less exposed to price risk, like we just mentioned. Uh, and they're more, ma more motivated to hedge their rent risk. And that's particularly true in cities where rent is volatile. So that all sounds pretty good. Insuring against rent volatility by, by owning. Um, but remember the perpetuity case, if you're not going to live in a house forever, then you're exposed to the mark to market value of your housing services perpetuity. And, uh, I think that can introduce some pretty significant risks. That was a long way of saying that I think the 2% risk premium <laughs> estimate for owning over renting <laughs> is probably fine, at least as a starting point. So we put all this together using Ontario as an example. Uh, the opportunity cost measured by their real yield on 10-year Government of Canada bonds is 1.72%, uh, plus 1% for property taxes, plus 1% for maintenance costs as a fraction of the home value, mm -hmm. minus a 1% expected capital gain on real estate, plus a 2% risk premium for owners bearing the risk of the single real estate asset. You sum all that up, and it's a little under 3%. And you multiply that by average prices in Ontario, and you get a dollar figure for user cost, which can be compared to rents and incomes. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so, from a user cost perspective, uh, owning a home in Ontario, and we'll, we'll put charts up in the YouTube video. Owning a home in Ontario is currently more expensive than history, going back to 1990, which is as far back as I could find data for all of the different points that we needed to calculate the user cost but it's not as exorbitant as prices relative to rents would make it seem. So that's pretty interesting. Prices are high. A uh, user cost, sorry, user cost of housing is high relative to history back to 1990, but it's nothing like when you look at prices relative to rents. So back to the bubble question, are our homeowners today willing to pay inflated prices for housing because they expect unrealistically high housing appreciation in the future? So I looked at the ratio of user cost uh, that's the implied rent that owners are paying to live in, a, in an owned home. I compared the ratio of that to actual rent, and it is historically high. But to bring that ratio back down to the historical average level, owners only have to be counting on a 1.84% real price return or, or a lower risk premium of 1.2% instead of 2%. So think about that for a sec. To, to bring the ratio of the user cost of housing to rents, back to its historical average level, back to 1990, owners are only assuming an additional 84 basis points in real price return over the 1% hmm. um, sort of baseline that, that I'm saying makes sense. So it's not like they're assuming a 7% or an 8% or a 15% return to justify current prices. 
So that's a, the prices are a bit high. They're a bit elevated, but is that a bubble? I don't know. I don't know if we could, I don't know if we could say that. Um, I, you could argue that based on where things are, like where interest rates are and where prices are and housing affordability and all that stuff, maybe it's reasonable to expect a lower than historical return. So maybe expecting 84 basis points is high compared to the, I don't know, 0% that you should be expecting, but you can't say that. You can't say what you should be expecting. It's an unknown. Um, and the other one is maybe people are, are using a, a, very, uh, a very low risk premium. And maybe you should be expecting uh, you're applying a higher risk premium right. to owning because of where interest rates and prices are. But either way, we're talking about, you know, moving the needle by a hair. It's not a... But the bottom line is there's, there's more to a story of a bubble than just a simple price increase. A simple snapshot I don't think we time. can... Yeah. I don't think we can hand wave and say we're, we're in a housing bubble. When you dig into the numbers and the actual cost of living in a home... Um, now, the other insight that we get from this user cost equation that's really interesting is that prices are expected to be particularly sensitive to interest rates when interest rates are already low. So, for, for example, if, if, real, if real 10-year interest rates were 6%, like they were in the late 90s, the user cost of housing would be 9% if we plug everything back into the equation, implying prices should be about 11 times rents. So that ratio of rents to, to prices based on a 9% user cost back then be about 11 times. If interest rates fall 1%, uh, that would lead to an expected 12.5% increase in prices just based on the price to rent ratio. So holding rents constant, how much should prices rise with a 1% reduction in interest rates? If we're starting at 6%, you expect a 12.5% increase in prices. Uh, when real interest rates are 1.5%, are which they approximately were in 2019 for a period of time, a 1% reduction, that's that's real 10-year government bond yields, a 1% reduction in the interest rate at that time um, would lead to an expected 50% increase in prices relative to rents. So you can see when rates are low already, the sensitivity of prices to rates is is huge. And maybe that's what we saw through the pandemic? I don't know. Okay, but let's go back to the 11 times rent. Does that mean that rents are being pushed down or prices are being pushed up? Like, What would the outcome be? Because if interest rates go up, I'm guessing the economy might slow, inflation may fall, therefore rents may fall. Now, the, the sensitivity to interest rates is also true in the other direction. Now, I, I've been in the financial services industry for, I don't know, what, eight or nine years now. Uh, geez, time flies. But I've been hearing like the whole time <laughs> that interest rates can't go any lower. <laughs> and I think they've gotten lower pretty much every year since I've been working in this industry. Um, but this time, I think it's really true. Rates can't go any lower. Uh, if they go up, if they go up, the expectation is that the sensitivity of prices to small in in interest rate increases. Uh, it should be substantial, is what you would expect. I mean, that's all else equal. Other stuff can change yep. too. But all else equal, rates go up. When rates are already low, you'd expect a substantial change in prices. If you're a short-term buyer or if you're trying to trade real estate, that's kind of scary. If you're buying a housing services perpetuity, it doesn't really matter if you're going to live there for a very, very long time or move to a correlated market. Uh, anyway, so I... I don't think we're in a bubble. I think it's still scary because I think a lot of people are buying houses that they don't plan to live in forever. And people are maybe buying right now with the pandemic in places that they may not end up if they have to go back to the office. And if you're buying in a small town like like I did, that's probably not going to be correlated to the city. So I think there's there's some price risk that people are taking on right now. But... I don't think that we're in a housing bubble. I think user costs are pretty much in line with with history. It's just that interest rates are really mm -hmm. low. What do you well, think? Well, I'm going to make a prediction that this will be an episode or a subject that a lot of people are going to go back and listen to again. There's a lot of details in this to, that's worth reconsidering slowly. Really interesting data. There's more to the story. There's cool. always more to the story.
Good to go into Talking Sense. Let's go ahead. So and these are the sense. cards from the University of Chicago Financial Education Initiative. So I picked out some. It's getting harder to find ones that we haven't done, but uh, here we go. Your wait, wait, what? wait. What do we do when we run out of cards? Do them over again, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I didn't really think that through. Jeez. Uh, All right. Your favorite band is touring. They'll be in your city next week, but they're playing a festival with other bands and only doing five songs. If you wait a month and drive two hours to a nearby city, you can see them play a full show. You can only afford to do one. What do you do? That's easy. Wait a month. Val same. Value of the show is much higher. Price is the same. No brainer. Okay, you agree. If you could only buy one kind of insurance, which of the following would you choose? So it says home insurance, health insurance, which in Canada we have national health care, so we don't worry about health insurance. So I'll change that to disability insurance and life insurance. Which would you choose? Home insurance, disability insurance, or life insurance? Uh, disability probability of being disabled or much greater than the probability of dying prematurely and I I think my human capital is worth a lot more than than my house right and, I mean you're younger so I think that makes sense for me I have to do the map but I'm guessing life insurance may be more important for me because you can only buy disability insurance another nine years or so for me but Depends on the circumstances. Okay, taxes are money you pay to your local, state, or federal government. The government uses that money to provide different things to the people it serves. What do you think taxes should pay for? Uh, roads, public utilities, schools. Kind of everything that you can't do on your own, I guess. Things that require scale that individuals can't possibly get. Uh, things that provide utility to a large cross-section of the population in question. Safety, national security, food safety. Yeah, things that in, things that individuals would never have the incentive to do. Yeah, that's probably that's a better answer. I, I listened to something really interesting about this a while ago. I can't even remember what it was, though, but it, it was along those lines that there are certain things that individuals just don't have the incentives to do and that's why you need a state to do certain things right that was a good answer anything else i don't think so we covered a lot of material and i'm surprised that it was only recording time a little over an hour so it might be an hour long episode i would have guessed it would have gone longer and next week like i said we're back with the year in review then we're off for a week that's true. I guess since we're going to be off, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do my semi-frequent ask for people to continue leaving the kind reviews and comments and rating the podcast five stars that apparently helps other people other people find it. And, and more, and pe- more and more people are finding the podcast, which is, which is great. And uh, in, in the Rational Reminder community, which contains a cross-section of the listeners, I think there's, there's – continues to be lots of really high quality discussions to the point where a lot of the discussions are uh, hard for me to jump into because the people who are having the conversations have done so much background research on the topic that they're discussing. That it's like, geez, <laughs> I just, I can't, I can't dip my toes in there, which is awesome. And I love it. And don't forget hats in the store. Tukes are available. <laughs> Got lots of merch here. We're happy to move. Okay, that's always. Thanks for listening.